name, which means empty or pointless. Listen to him as he reasons. Starting in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 15. Now get in the flow of this as he logically reasons this out. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And here's the point. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. So he's saying if Christ was not raised, your faith is vain. And the second point we read too, that the apostles then were liars. Now the implications of this if it is false that Christ be not raised, is that nothing pertaining to the Bible, including the God who revealed it, is true. And the only place we can turn if the God of the Bible does not exist and the Bible is not the Word of God would be to materialism and evolution as to how things got here, how things came to existence. Thus, the great burden of preaching and the evidence offered in the first century as they went about to preach Christ and crucified was to prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is deity. This will tie in somewhat to what we had to say last week when I mentioned to you that I heard on YouTube a Muslim declare that the Bible nowhere taught that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So why am I looking at the conversion of Saul of Tarsus? Number one, he wrote this in defense of the resurrection of Christ. But this transformation that took place in his life and in the lives of others who knew Jesus points to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I found this quote, which I think is rather interesting. He is an Orthodox Jewish scholar and he admitted, actually, what Paul was saying here. This is from Pincus Lapidi, or Lapid, who was former chairman of the Applied Linguistics Department at Israel's Bar Ilan University. It appeared in Time Magazine May 7, 1979. Here's what he said. If the disciples were totally disappointed and on the verge of desperate flight because of the very real reason of the crucifixion. It took another very real reason in order to transform them from a band of disheartened and dejected Jews into the most self-confident missionary society in world history. I don't know whether any of that as to what he really con confessed, because it's true what he said impressed him any or made any changes on his life as a Jew who denies that Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God. But he at least reasoning intellectually concluded that a bodily resurrection could have possibly been the reason and I tell you according to the inspired scriptures it was the reason. There are people who say well you can't go to the Bible. Well I want to know why you can't. Anything we know about antiquity, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, whatever, 1,500 years ago, has to come from the writings that were done then by people who purported to write the facts in the case. Well, we don't know anything about Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, and a host of others who have far less, far less materials declaring them to us and what they did than we do when it comes to the Bible. The Bible is just fully attested to by so many things in history and so many things done in the first three centuries following Christ. Now one great example then 
of such tremendous and amazing transformation is found in the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. And this is how we will approach his study of his conversion. We don't realize many times that because we've been reared in a denominational setting, it's been around for hundreds of years, and people who believe in God, the Bible, and the need of salvation and various areas involved there, but they all believe in that in general. And they believe in churches and worship and so forth. And so we, we tend to be brought up in an atmosphere, an environment, a culture that deals with denominational Christianity. None of that existed then. The burden of proof for the church to begin with was that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah, the only begotten Son of God. There it is. You don't find in the New Testament anywhere arguments over one must be baptized who has believed in Christ or not. You do find a lot about Jesus Christ is the Son of God and their efforts to prove it. Because if they prove Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, that He is the King, they knew what it meant to be under a king in His kingdom. You do what He says. So if you prove that Jesus Christ is whom He claimed to be, then it was just second nature to them that they're going to obey Him. And we need to understand that. So we need to know something about Saul of Tarsus before, prior to his conversion. First of all, he was a Pharisee. We'll go back over some of this more. But he was a persecutor of Christians. We know that. But he became the peerless apostle Paul to the Gentiles, who himself would undergo and endure great persecution by unbelieving Jews, even as he had delivered as an unbeliever to the church. So in this sermon, we'll consider why Saul's conversion serves as strong evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to begin by reading from Paul's own pen, Galatians chapter 1, 13 and 14. Galatians 1, 13 and 14. He says, For ye have heard of my conversation, my manner of life, my conduct, in time past in the Jews' religion. Well, what was that, Paul? How that beyond measure, I persecuted the church of God. In other words, beyond measure. You couldn't do any more against the church of God and Christians than I did. And he says, I wasted it. Notice what he says about his position among the Jews and profited in the Jews' religion above many of my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. This says a lot. He is confessing to us what he had been before he became a Christian. Notice that he persecuted the church. In Acts 8, 1 through 3, we see he's introduced to us as a great persecutor of the church, beginning in Jerusalem. When you pursue through the study of Acts, you come into Acts 9, which is also the chapter which gives the first account of his conversion. Verses 1 and 2, he persecuted the church beyond Jerusalem. You might even think, Somebody would walk up and say, don't you have any better things to do in Judaism than persecute the church? And I think Paul would say, no, I don't. Now, why did he do this? Well, we know a lot about Paul's disposition of heart and attitude in anything that he started to do. And it's simple to know why he did it. Because he believed he ought to persecute the church to be pleasing to God. Acts 26, verses 9 through 11. Again, Luke's record of his own statements there in Jerusalem. He was, in his own life, advancing in Judaism. He was a young scholar, highly educated for his day. And I'm not speaking of the fact, too, that being a part of the Roman Empire, he was a freeborn Roman citizen, which put him in a tremendous position. But among the Jews, that wouldn't make that much difference. But with the work God would, had called him to do as an apostle to the Gentiles, it would make a lot of difference, and we see it when we read about his life. But among the Jews, here's what he said, or what is said, and Luke records what he said in Acts 22 and verse 3. I am verily 
a man which am a Jew. Born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. In other words, as you are today, I once was in Judaism. So he was advancing as a young man in Judaism. He was a scholar. Nobody was ahead of him, he says. In social standing, Saul indicates he was ahead of many of his fellows in Judaism. He had the confidence of and power from the chief priest, Acts 26, 12. They had given him letters of authority to go to Damascus and Syria, advancing beyond Judea and outside of Jerusalem. He was willing to go anywhere and arrest Christians and bring them back bound to Jerusalem. And if you look in Acts 23 and verse 6, you'll see he was proud to be the strictest of the sect of the Jews, a Pharisee. He even said, I was the son of a Pharisee meaning I'm totally immersed in Judaism as a Pharisee. The Sadducees were larger, wealthier, and very loose. They were the priestly class at this time. They didn't believe in spirits of the resurrection or angels, but the Pharisees did. The Pharisees' big problem, which we realize in reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the life of Christ was, that they were such sticklers of the law, they made laws that bound on the people what the law of Moses did not. And Jesus would say to them, How be it in vain do you worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And they were very much his antagonists during his life. Now with such a religious background as Saul had, wouldn't you say he would naturally be prejudiced, Acts 26, 9, and what we read of him does not indicate how prejudiced he would be because he evidenced it. You'll remember that in Acts 7, verse 58, he did not mind seeing a fellow die if he were a servant of Christ, for he held the clothes of those that stoned Stephen, the first Christian martyr. And he says himself in Acts 26, and verse 10, that he gave his voice against the Christians. I'm supportive, I'm with it, I'm in the middle of it. I'm every way possible against the church of Christ. I'm against all that it stands for and is. As far as he was concerned, it was just simply uh, a heretical movement. But when you consider all this about this young man, fiery, whatever he set to do, he did it with all of his might. Yet, this very strongly biased and prejudiced, prominent, young Pharisee, highly educated, scholarly, zealous, fierce in his opposition to the church of our Lord, became one of the most influential Christians of all time. That should be shocking to people. For those who are not Christians today and who deny the deity of Christ, how do they explain this? We read to you what one Jew said. How did this happen to make this transformation of Saul of Tarsus to the great and peerless apostle of Christ? Well, let's look at a few things. There will be those who will give various explanations as to what happened. And they might even say that, well, maybe there were ul an ul at least one ulterior motive in Paul's mind as to the reason that he chose to be what he was. Well, let's say ulterior motive. In other words, he became a Christian because he wanted to get wealthy. I think you'll see that the position he had, not only would all of this power and prestige uh, be his, but usually that means I'm on the road to getting wealth also. We don't know about his family and what they were. They were able to send him to Jerusalem take care of him while he went to Harvard. <laughs> That's what it amounted to. There's no reason to think that he might have been quite well off himself. 
because he had all of that with the Jews. And he left it for poverty, if you please, in following Christ as closely as anybody ever did, 1 Corinthians 4, 11 through 12, and Acts chapter 20, verses 33 through 34. So I don't think we can say he converted to achieve wealth. Well, maybe it could have been fame. People like fame. You know, fame and fortune, we usually say together. So here's fame. That's the reason he became a Christian. Well, he had fame with the Jews. You can't read about him as we did briefly and not see that he was certainly ahead of his fellows and up-and-coming leader of the Jews. They entrusted him to go into other places and carry out their will regarding persecuting Christians and that he would be what he ought to be. He was their boy, if you please. And then all you have to do is look at what he experienced as an apostle of Christ and a Christian in 1 Corinthians 4, 10 through 13. He will, in defense of his apostleship, list the suffering that he went through for the cause of Christ. Terrible things. Regarded as foolish and weak. And that even happened among brethren. If you read 1 Corinthians. He said we're viewed as the filth of the world by those in the world, the off-scouring of the earth. So I don't think we can say that he gave, became a Christian to obtain wealth or he became a Christian for fame's sake. Well, could it have been power? Those three tend to go together. Well, he had that with the Jews. If you compare this with what he suffered as a Christian, again, 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 28, I don't think you can find an ulterior motive for Saul's conversion. None whatsoever. Neither wealth, fame, or power. But then somebody comes along and says, well, maybe he was deceived. Maybe he was led into believing a falsehood, a lie. My next question would be, who deceived him? If he was deceived, who deceived him? His friends would not. For they, along with him, were champions in opposing the church. Christians certainly could not because of his persecution against them. In fact, when you consider him after his conversion in Jerusalem, they were still afraid of him. And it took Barnabas vouching for him that he was genuinely converted before they would deal with him. This man had some reputation as a persecutor of the church. Which also tells us that we should prove people before we just accept them at their word. If the early church was willing to prove Paul and not just accept him because he said he was converted, then such is a great example for us. He put them into prison. He chased after them as they went from town to town, Acts 8, 3, and chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. As I said, uh, I want to emphasize this. Even after his conversion, many still feared him, Acts 9, 26. And when you look at his testimony, what he said about himself, it doesn't allow for the possibility of deception. He claimed to receive his gospel from Jesus and not man, Galatians 1, 11 and 12. He claimed to have seen Jesus raised from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 8. The empirical nature of his testimony precludes the possibility of him being a deceived man and became a Christian because he believed a lie. Well, of course, there's the other one. He's crazy. He's a lunatic. You remember when he appeared before Festus and used his defense to preach the gospel to him? Festus said, much learning doesn't make thee mad. He didn't mean angry. He meant a lunatic. Other, others have tried, attempted to explain his conversion. They've done so in psychological terms. Uh, they've said stuff like, 
Well, there's intense persecution of the church caused him to have a guilty conscience that wrote on him so much he, he just couldn't stand it. So it caused him to embrace that which he persecuted. And when you take that, then the, the great heat of the noonday sun on his way to Damascus caused him to become delirious. He, he just thought he saw Jesus. A lot more I'd like to say about that. But time is not on our side on that point. I want you to consider his own testimony, Saul's testimony, or Paul. Acts 23.1 is taught plainly that he had a clear conscience regarding persecuting the Christians. And that's because of what we said earlier. He believed he was doing it to please God. Acts 26.9, thus it's something for him to be a good Jew, acceptable to God, that he must do. He tells us, as he writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, that he did it out of ignorance. That's the reason he knew that he received mercy. All that you read about him persecuting the church, he didn't believe in Christ. And thus he did it out of ignorance. It's interesting to note that he saw Jesus, or Jesus revealed himself to him, on more than one occasion. It wasn't just on the road to Damascus. We can give you several verses. You might like to jot them down. He tells about Christ's appearance to him in Acts chapter 18, verses 9 through 10. Chapter 22, verses 17 through 21. Chapter 23, verse 11. And 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 9. Now, there's a lot I'd like to develop about that. But it tells us that the peculiar position of the office of an apostle, then what they received, all the apostles, because all the apostles received what he did, they received all of their revelation concerning the gospel directly from Jesus Christ. They didn't need anybody to tell them anything about those things. Now, when you read his epistles, I want to ask you, do they seem like letters written by a crazy, irrational man? I don't think so. Even he says, prove all things, hold back that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5.21. I think last week, by the way, and I quoted that scripture, I said 1 John 5.21. But it's not. Now, Paul says you need to do that. Would he say you need to do that? And I don't. The only plausible explanation is this. He saw the resurrection Christ, the resurrected Christ. And that is the explanation given by Paul himself. First of all, he did that before the mob there in Jerusalem in Acts 22, verses 1 through 16. And when he appeared before King Agrippa and Festus, the Roman governor, Acts 26, 12 through 13. He had no problem at all saying that he had seen the Lord. And when you consider that he suffered what he did rather than recant and say, well, it was really just me declaring that. I didn't really believe it, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. He underwent all those persecutions. In fact, he offers that as the reason you know I'm genuine. In fact, he's saying when he offers them, do you really think I'd undergo all of this if I didn't know it to be true? It's the only explanation that's adequate to explain his conversion. This is why he was willing to forego all the advantages of his position in, Ju in Judaism. It's why he was willing to suffer poverty, shame, and persecution. Listen to what he said, and we should think of our own faithful service to God or the lack of it as we read these words of Paul as to what he gave up for the cause of Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Philippians 3 verse 8. 
We can only conclude from that that he had the courage of his convictions to act upon facts. That which he witnessed, he knew the truth, and he knew that he knew it, and he wasn't going to depart from it. As Paul said of himself, concerning when Christ appeared to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? which again should remind us that he was persecuting the church, but it's the spiritual body of Christ, Colossians 1.18. Thus you persecute the church. Christ says, I take it personally. You're persecuting me. Who art thou, Lord, he said. That comments further on the fact that he was ignorant of these things. Who art thou, Lord? Plainly, Jesus says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The goads, in those days, driving oxen, they'd have a stick with a sharp hook on it, and it'd punch the oxen to make him go faster. And the oxen would kick back at it, as cows are wont to do. Well, if he hit it, it didn't help him any. And what Christ is saying to Paul, you're opposing what's impossible to oppose. It's going to kick back on you. It's hard to kick against the pricks. And then, of course, out of that whole thing, he asks what he must do, and he's told to go into the city of Damascus, street called Straight, and there it shall be told thee what thou must do. And though it, it, that he didn't appear to him to convert him, he appeared to him, so he could be an apostle of Christ, declared he had seen the resurrected Lord. Others were being converted all over the place at that time, hearing the gospel, believing and obeying it, because it offered evidence that Christ Jesus rose from the dead, even as that same gospel offers it today to convince any honest-hearted soul, Luke 8, 15, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by Him, and He has all authority in heaven and on earth, and we must obey Him in order to be saved from our sins. So to be an apostle of Christ, he had to witness the resurrected Lord. And he says then concerning the vision of Christ, when Christ told him to go where he could learn the plan of salvation, what does Paul say in Acts 26, 19? I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Isn't that amazing? Stood there knowing now by proof of the revelation of Christ that this is the Messiah, the Son of God, but he still does not know what to do to be saved from his sins. And so Christ tells him where he can go and find out. And of course he'd appear down and ask the gospel preacher, told him to go there, worked it all out, didn't he? And he was told there as a believing, repentant person what he lacked. And when Ananias realized that he was a believer, that he was showing forth repentance in his actions, he said, and now why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. I can tell you this without it even being said explicitly. Nobody ever saw water enough, quick enough, that was deep enough to bury a man in than Saul would have at that time. He wouldn't try to figure out a way, well, we'll go tomorrow. That wasn't in his disposition. It wasn't a cut of his character. God's will has been told me and I know it. And I will do it immediately. So the conversion of Saul is best explained by his own testimony that it was a resurrected Jesus who appeared to him. Not once, but continuously throughout the rest of this man's life. He did that. And thus, it serves his own faith in Christ, his own declaration, his own suffering for the fact that he saw Christ serves as one of the greatest evidences of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What's the significance of the resurrection of Christ? Well, for the one who doesn't believe he's the Son of God, neither did Saul of Tarsus. And it ought to say to you that nothing of this world should take the place of believing and obeying Christ to become a Christian. Paul says, I gave up all things. The unbeliever must know then that Jesus is deity, Romans 1, 4. And that it has been appointed unto him to be the final judge of all people, Acts 17, 30 and 31. The 
time of this ignorance God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he's ordained this man Jesus Christ. And he proved it by raising him from the dead. Now for us, most of us, who are members of the church, who are believers as the New Testament uses that term, it verifies the adequacy of our justification. Our Lord's blood does wash us clean from our sins. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth from all sin, 1 John 1, 7, again. Then Paul would say himself to the church at Rome, in Romans 4 and verse 25, He said of Christ who was delivered for our offenses and was raised for our justification. There is then, as you read 1 Corinthians 15, there is then the hope, the expectation of our own resurrection from the dead. We sang him a moment ago here, I labor and toil as I look for a home, just a humble abode among men. But where is our eternal place of abode as faithful Christians? Well, it's a mansion above. As Paul would say it, in a house not made with hands, 2 Corinthians 5, eternal in the heavens. So there's the hope of the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 22, Paul gives some wonderful words for all of us. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so, watch it, in Christ shall all be made alive. And that corresponds to Ephesians 1, 3, where he says all spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. When I think of every day, I have done this for years, it's especially so now at this stage of the game. The longer I'm here, the longer I'm away from heaven. The longer I haven't found my full reward that God wants for every one of us. And while there's a great mystery unrevealed to us about the actual process of the Spirit leaving the body, James says the body apart from the Spirit's dead, so I know that's the simplest definition I have of death. So when the real you or me leaves this body because it biologically can't function anymore, then what happens? Well, Luke 16 tells us plainly that those saved go into the place of paradise, Abraham's bosom, to a place of comfort that our minds can't grasp. And thus we should prepare our lives to step over into glory land. We sing about it enough. So through such evidence as the conversion of Saul, God has borne witness to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Thus, I ask each one of us, and it should be on our lips every day, have you responded to the evidence with the obedience of faith? It is a daily thing where we're taught to examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith. It is something that should permeate our very being. Because this, this earth is not my home. I'm, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home anymore. There's something about you that weds you to this world. That dreads the day of your death. Then you need to work on yourself. <laughs> No one wants to go through the process of dying on a human being. We, we know, though, through such things as this, we know, I say, there's a great day coming, which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. They that have done good in the resurrection of life, and those that have done evil in the resurrection of damnation. So when you read about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, Realize that that is just another bit of evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God 
and that what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote about him, he did. And that he was raised from the dead to die no more. He is our hope, Romans 15, 4. And if you're not a Christian, we appeal to you, we beg of you to obey the gospel and become a Christian. If you're a child of God and you've slipped, you've wandered, you're not living like you know the Bible says you ought to, we urge you to repent of those sins and confessing them, we'll pray with you. God will hear, he'll forgive. So if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.